you, Joel. Thank you, the organizers, for this uh, nice event, for inviting me to present. Uh, let me share the screen with, uh, with you, and we're going to start the presentations. OK. Now it should be in full screen mode. Good. So welcome, everybody. My name is Pavel Polak. Um, I'm from the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, this is a joint work with two of my colleagues from the same department, Tang Cheng, who is a, a young and talented PhD student in our department, and Stan Ryasov, who is a professor also in the department, uh, chair of quantitative finance. Uh, I'm a statistician by training, and um, I'm very much interested in all kind of problems which uh, involve data and uh, COVID-19. Well, uh, we all are very much affected, so uh, we teamed up and decided to contribute to this uh, topic and uh, do some research. And we also have a lot of background in finance, so we are quite good in detecting uh, uh, you know, certain signals in uh, large noise, small signal setup so uh, we we try to employ some of our knowledge and techniques in this in this um, application as well uh, so what's the goal here uh, is um, we're gonna try to classify and predict or in particular predict uh, the severity progression or the severity of patients uh, with covid 19 so uh, we want to look at uh, at patients blood samples, um, identify some factors from that blood, uh, proteomic, uh, lipidomic, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, based on those factors, we want to say whether the patient is going to recover easily or have a progression to, to, uh, to a severe uh, case, uh, including ICU and, and worst, worst case scenarios. Uh, the obvious applications are to to and to classify uh, to classify patients into those which need more uh, immediate care and those which can be sent home. Uh, maybe also who need the, the vaccine earlier than the other, and so on. Um, the, there is a lot of literature which does uh, similar work, uh, but uh, all of them either employ uh, purely expert-based uh, guidelines. So they there are some some classification tools created by medical doctors based on their expertise uh, to 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 do so, uh, or some um, machine learning uh, uh, motivated uh, methods which. Uh, uh, which is usual machine learning methods require a lot of um, a lot of data to be trained and uh, are easy to be overfit and especially in this COVID-19 data sets you can see there there's despite the fact that it's a global pandemic the data sets are collected by individual groups from different hospitals from different uh, research labs and they are not so big data sets so uh, there are some problems, and also those uh, those methods are going to detect factors which which classify the patients, but they uh, they require uh, multiple factors to do so. So in the order of 20, 30, or even uh, 70 or 200 factors used in a, in a machine learning method to, to be able to classify the patient, that's not doesn't really uh, correspond to to a feasible medical test uh, where. Uh, and you can you know, collect a couple of uh, factors from the mm, from the blood patient from the mm, blood from the patient's blood, and uh, classify uh, based on that with probably much lower uh, measurement error than if you analyze the whole spectrum of of the blood. Okay, so uh, that's our focus. Using uh, we're going to use pairs of multiomic factors to to classify patients. Uh, so I will start with a motivation or uh, uh, original research which, to which we compare against. Uh, uh, then I'm going to talk about our model, algorithm, and empirical results and uh, conclude. Uh, we have limited time, so I will skip a lot of slides. You see there are 56 of them, so we have to uh, jump through them much faster. So motivation, well, we all know that COVID-19 is a global pandemic and causes enormous amount of deaths and uh, uh, there are millions and millions of cases. It grows. It still grows very rapidly around the world, and uh, it's, it's a global pandemic problem. Mm. About 80% of patients infected by uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus displayed mild symptoms with good prognosis. However, 20% end up in, in the hospital with some respiratory distress, distress and require immediate oxygen therapy, and so on. So we uh, we classify those as clinically severe. Uh, if they satisfy those uh, three conditions. 
uh, the, the other classification that we're gonna do is ICU versus non-ICU patients. And uh, the, uh, the uh, right, patients exhibiting these clinical manifestations have already progressed the clinical severe phase and require immediate access to specialized in intensive uh, care. Another motivation for this research also comes from uh, the director of NIH who said that it would be helpful if a simple blood test could predict early on which uh, patients are most likely to progress to severe and life-threatening illness and which are more likely to recover without much need for medical intervention. He wrote this couple, I think two months ago on his blog and uh, we, we decided also to look into this at the time. So uh, we, we found some research which, uh, uh, which already is uh, in this direction. Uh, the two papers uh, which we found uh, uh, like all of them are very recent. Uh, it's a um, large scale multiomic analysis of COVID-19 severity and proteomic and metabolomic characterization of COVID-19 patients uh, published in cell systems and cell respectively. Uh, the first paper analyzes proteomic, metabolomic, lipidomic, and transcriptomic factors uh, of uh, from patient COVID-19 patients' blood and uh, some control group. The second uh, the second paper does the same, but only using proteins metabolites. We have the data from those two papers, and we're going to try to do a better job with uh, with different models in terms of classifying the patients. Uh, hypothesized that uh, SARS-CoV-2 induces characteristic molecular changes that can be detected in the serum of severe patients, right? And uh, mm, so what's the first paper? Uh, the first paper has uh, 100 uh, COVID-19 patients, 50 uh, non-ICU, 50 ICU, for each of the patients using a massive spectrometry method uh, on the blood sera, they obtain uh, over 14,000 factors, including 500 proteomics, over 100 metabolomics, 600 and more lipidomics, and over 13,000 trans transcriptomics. And they also have 25 non-COVID-19 patients as a control group, 10 non-ICU, 15 ICU patients. Uh, we, uh, we selected uh, 231 factors out of those 14,000 using some standard statistical methods for uh, like log two fold change and um, the t-test uh, with some Benjamin Cooper adjusted p-values. Uh, so we already reduced this from 14,000 to 23 to 231. That's uh, similar, that's exactly the same as they did in the paper. Um, and the final model in the paper is a random forest model uh, which separates the predict uh, versus uh, which which separates which predicts the severe versus non-severe. Uh, however, it's prone to overfeed because uh, the sample size consists of only 100 patients and there are 14,000 uh, factors over 20% uh, out of sample class, and they are, they have over 20% classification error out of sample. So uh, with 14,000 factors and 100 patients, it is difficult to. Uh, to construct a model which doesn't overfit, uh, uh, and uh, if they do it out, if they look out of sample, they have very large um, classification error. Therefore, uh, we uh, we use this uh, data and um, also run a random forest in it uh, with um, classification for ICU versus non-ICU patients. And uh, this allowed us to achieve a little bit smaller classification error, 14%, but it's still uh, relatively high out of sample error. Uh, the other paper uh, is uh, a little bit more uh, complex in terms of data structure. They have three cohorts, um, 31 patients, and then 10 patients, then again, 19 patients. And the idea here is they, they train the model on those 31 patients and over 17, uh, I'm sorry, 1,700 factors. And uh, once they train this model, they evaluate it out of sample performance on uh, 10, uh, 10 patients. And then uh, based on the trained model, they only collect the, mm, the, uh, the factors that were detected by this model to be significant predictors. And for those uh, only 29 factors, as you can see here, uh, and only for those 29 factors, they collect additional data for additional 19 patients, and then they reconfirm their results on those 19 patients. But again, when you look closer on the results, the, the results are very vogue. 
uh, they have over 20% out of sample classification error uh, in their final model because overall they employ 29 factors on 31 patients. So again, the ratio of variables to data is almost one to one. So um, they uh, even methods like random forest, which are rather um, uh, data um, expensive. So they require a lot of data to, to properly train them. Uh, they, they achieve very large um, out of sample classification error. Finally, there is a third paper, which um, uh, does the, the work out, um, is from a different uh, approach. So um, here are some medical experts. They are uh, based on, on some uh, patients' data and their own observations. They identified there are uh, two, uh, two factors, uh, interleukin IL-6 and interleukin IL-10, uh, that can be used to, to, to construct a um, so-called Dublin-Boston score. Uh, which is a ratio of those two. And based on this ratio, uh, they, they can classify patients to be severe versus non-severe. And um, this is the, the, the first and only COVID-19 specific severity prognostic score to guide clinical decision-making. Uh, it is easily calculated and can be applied to a spectrum of hospitalized patients. And uh, yeah, the, the practicality of it is because it's very simple. It involves only two factors and a simple ratio of them. Uh, and uh, at least based on the medical expertise, it delivers or some, some sort uh, to guide clinical decisions. We're going to compare it uh, also against our methods. So uh, what, how, how we approach this problem, so we, use, uh, we start with a simple logistic regression, simplest classification model. Uh, and uh, here our predictors are the different factors from the, uh, from the patient's blood, Sarah. Uh, after preliminary selection of this uh, log twofold change and p-values, uh, we found uh, the, the factors which uh, significantly differ between severe and non-severe patients. And uh, among them, uh, we're going to pick uh, pairs. We're going to look uh, for all possible pairs of factors and see how they predict in sample and out of sample using logistic regression. And then, uh, in order to further improve this classification, we're going to nonlinearly transform each of those factors using uh, non-parametric statistics, using spline regression. So instead of, uh, you can imagine, instead of having like uh, just linear relation, the higher the factor, the more, the more likely the patient to be severe, we're going to have some nonlinear relation and uh, the, the classification boundary, uh, you're going to see it's not going to be a line, but it's going to be some some curvature, some shape, depending on uh, uh, you know, what kind of spline method we use and depending also what the data uh, um, provides to us. We're going to have a couple of those different uh, non-parametric models uh, with uh, linear splines and quadratic splines. Uh, these are the most popular models in, used in practice and they are a good trade-off between flexibility and estimation order. Uh, then, um, Right, so we transform each of the biomarkers using uh, the spline method and we plug it in into, regre into logistic regression and run the logistic regression on the transformed data. So here you have examples of the transformed uh, um, factors. On the x-axis, you have the original factor and the y-axis, you have the, its uh, nonlinear transformation. So you can see that for uh, there is some um, some of them are still monotonic, but maybe there is some curvature. So uh, patients with very high value are transformed to a very low level and then rapidly growing up and with when the values are low, the, the transform data is much faster growing up. Or you have some convexity, some curvature, uh, certain levels of, of the factor as Severe and levels below or level above, maybe you know outside of uh, uh, of uh, you often when you do a medical test of your blood you have uh, you have confidence bounds in which levels of certain uh, blood characteristics should be kept and whatever if it's to the left or to the right it's actually bad right and so uh, the same here this nonlinear transformations can be used. 
uh, okay, uh, even more nonlinearity can be introduced. I'm going to skip this. So this is how we select uh, our 231 factors in the first round using just log to fold change and uh, the p-values. Uh, we, we, we pick those most, um, most significant uh, differences between, between, in this case, ICU and non-ICU patients. Mm, and these are our candidates for, uh, for, for factors, for good, uh, for good predictors. And uh, you looking at uh, like the competitive model from the from the paper from the first paper, uh, these are the the factors that were finally selected by a random forest. You see uh, there are different uh, me uh, measure of accuracy uh, and uh, the the Gini index. And you can see that there is a lot of them, right? Uh, I don't remember now, it was in the beginning, I think 29 or something like this, or uh, this is just the top uh, couple of factors that they select that they need to, to classify patients. And um, right, they, uh, they, they are quite persistent in, in, in the values, they don't decrease fast or fast enough. Uh, this is the rock curve. So uh, the higher, the better, and the more to the left corner, the better uh, for the classifier in terms of out of sample classification uh, error. So uh, if you're in the upper left corner, uh, your true positive is equal to one. So you manage to classify all the true, uh, true COVID uh, ICU patients correctly. Uh, if you are uh, in the uh, in the upper left corner, so your x uh, axis uh, on the x axis you have a zero. You have then a zero false positive rate. So you manage to classify correctly uh, all the um, as well all the um, non non ICU patients or non severe patients. And you see that this random forest method uh, it does quite good job. It achieves 94, 94, um, 0 0.94 uh, AUC score. And uh, so, so it overall classifies 80% uh, patients uh, correctly and that's a small error in terms of uh, false positive. Uh, when uh, for the second data set, these are the, um, the factors that uh, we selected. Uh, again, using twofold and uh, p-values. Uh, these are the, uh, the random forest results. And you can see again, a large number of factors that being selected by the um, by the authors in those papers, which are necessary to build their classifier. And this is the rock curve from, uh, from their model. Again, around 90%, 95% accuracy and uh, above 95% positive, true positive rate. Uh, this is the Dublin Boston uh, index, Dublin Boston for ICU patients versus non ICU. And you see that it provides mixed results. That doesn't mean that if you have Dublin Boston score much higher, that you are already non ICU, or if your Dublin Boston score is much lower, that you are immediately ICU. There are patients in both, uh, in both uh, bar plots which have uh, uh, low Dublin Boston score and large Dublin Boston score. So it's not very are uh, very, um, very good uh, guidelines for, uh, for patients uh, regarding the patient's prognosis. Uh, this is the rock curve for the Dublin Boston score. You see much, it's much worse than the one which I showed you for random forests. And uh, it's only have AUC of 0.61. So it's not really much better than uh, throwing a coin. Uh, so, uh, but this is what's being used. Mm, and these are the results from, uh, from our uh, from our pairs, I'm just going to zoom in here. Uh, you can see that uh, with only with a pair of factors, we found multiple pairs of factors which actually can achieve uh, values very similar to those uh, as uh, in random forest. So we get 94, 95%. Uh, depending of how nonlinear model we're going to use, we can, and this is all out of sample, 96% accuracy in terms of predicting who is going to uh, who's going to go to ICU, who is not going to go to to the ICU, using just pairs of uh, of predictors, right? And uh, this is how it looks in terms of uh, classification uh, on uh, on the patients, and this. Uh, uh, the red dots are the ICU patients, uh, the, the white crosses are the non-ICU, and uh, on the left you have plots with linear classification, and then thanks to the splines we are getting more and more shape and curvature uh, in terms of uh, separating those two groups of patients uh, 
in terms of the pairs of factors on the x-axis and the y-axis, you have different factors that we've used. And uh, I have more of those plots, depending on what pair of factors you use, you can, you can separate uh, the groups mm, and so on. We have all tables with, uh, with, uh, with those pairs of biomarkers and how they performed, ranked in, some, in terms of likelihood, in terms of uh, out of sample classification error. I'm going to skip this. Uh, what I want to show you oh, yeah. also. Maybe you could wrap up in the next minute or so. Yeah. So the final result is that we found complementary pairs. So the complementary pairs, I mean that there are some pairs of biomarkers which work extremely well uh, on certain group of patients. And there are other biomarkers which work uh, extremely well for other groups of patients. And by doing clustering analysis, we, we end up with triples uh, or quadruples of, of factors, which actually achieve uh, uh, even 96, 97% uh, out of sample classification uh, um, accuracy and uh, you have here a comparison between our method, the blue line, and uh, uh, the other methods, including uh, including the uh, light blue, the random forest with you know thirty factors and uh, the the Boston, uh, the Dublin Boston score, which is almost a diagonal line. Uh, we did it for both data sets. In both cases, we got very good results. So to summarize, we we are able to provide with this technology a short list of pairs that perform well in classifying, measuring the severity of the patients. Some of these pairs achieve almost a perfect performance in out of sample. Original research 231 and 29 factors. This study only two factors. Some of these pairs after nonlinear transformation, I'd skip that, but they are even, uh, they can even uh, separate uh, non-COVID and COVID patients. So we can complement this with, um, so to be robust against uh, non-COVID patients which are in the ICU unit, for example, for a different reason. Uh, discussions, uh, they presented, right, so this is all preliminary study using the other data sets. We are looking forward to the uh, possibility of collaboration with some medical experts, with biostatisticians who, uh, who would like to, to collaborate, who have access to some interesting data. Uh, we, are, we are very good with statistics and we would like to extend this study to, uh, to, to, to bigger samples to, to form uh, some, some maybe lead to some real medical tests uh, that can be employed to analyze uh, patient's progression. Okay, Thank great. you.